Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time again for what's quickly becoming one of our most talked about shows here on the network. This Week with Wendy, the only show where you'll find real talk about what's really happening here in Southern California and our whole SoCal estate of mind. With Wendy Ross, who after decades of working at real estate brokerages in Silicon Valley and Orange County, she decided it was time to create a real estate business that did it things really different. And so she did. That's when Veracity Real Estate was started. The time was right for a renewed commitment to bespoke client advocacy at all price levels, seldom available within high cost markets like Southern California. Wendy has built a company of data-driven real estate investment advisors who are truth seekers and truth tellers. And today, well, we're hoping she's going to tell us some truths here. The truths she tell us, I, I can't believe them half the time, Wendy. What, what truths you got to share these days? We seem to be in unprecedented times. We absolutely are. It made it um, mandatory for me to do this show with you because there's so much <laughs> to talk about every single week. There is. And the stuff that you talk about, I don't hear anybody else either talk about it at all or put it together in the perspective that you do. Give, give me the overall picture. So... Each week, I really do. I look forward to it, starting with your markup wrap-up and then the guests you bring in here. So what, yeah. what do you got for us this week here? Well, you know, there's always, always something. Um, and I'm just going to do a little shout-out. Happy birthday to me. So thanks for having me here on my birthday. And me too. It's your birthday today. Mine was uh, two days ago. I know. Happy belated birthday. We Capricorns have to stick together. we got to stick together. And we got to throw each other parties because nobody else does this time of year. Everybody's burned out and tired. And I always felt robbed this time of year here having a birthday with you. All right, Paul. Five o'clock at Memphis in Costa Mesa. <laughs> Be there. <laughs> okay. I'll buy you a birthday drink. There we go. All right. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Well, you, as you said, you know, you can count on me every week to bring you some analysis you won't find anywhere else. And one of the ways I can provide the analysis that you won't find anywhere else is by surrounding myself with experts like Dennis. You know, we want to bring a different perspective and different experience to real estate, something to your point you're not seeing and getting anywhere else, but it's super important. So please welcome Dennis Hensling. We're going to have a deep discussion about all things real estate and real estate finance. We might even like tiptoe into automobiles. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> if he'll let me. Uh, Dennis is an incredibly seasoned uh, mortgage finance professional. Um, he's the consummate professional, vice president at United American Mortgage Company. He leads their residential lending division. He's got history working in real estate finance, construction loans, wholesale lending, mortgage marketing practices, and of course, FHA and VA loans as well. Dennis has been my go-to lending professional for more than a decade, and consistently every time I direct someone to him they come back and they're just deliriously happy so I couldn't be more more pleased to have him here today thank you so before we get into all things Dennis let me quickly frame the real estate market from last week and as you know last week was the first week of the year and so the data was interesting because it encompassed the last few days of December and the year-end wrap-up for Orange County always has those last-minute Hail Mary crushing escrows to get them closed before the end of the year. So the data tends to be a bit bloated, even though there are two legal holidays there between Christmas and New Year's Eve. Even so, even in light of the expectation that I had that the prior week's data would be big, this last week was really impressive. We had 279 new homes come on the market, which is much, much needed. That was a 231% week over week increase, Paul. Nuts. 272 of them went into escrow. That was also an 18% increase. 478 homes sold. That was a 10% increase. So super, super robust beginning of the year, which is exciting. Because so much activity has been pushed through the end of the year and is still in its bloated pipeline, the median price went up week over week 4%. So the first week of the year, we started at $955,000 for the median. This last week, that rose to 9675 dollars I wouldn't put too much stock in that. Week to week, it's going to bounce up and down. It really depends upon just the mix of the properties that are being sold. We're just going to have to wait and see what the Q, uh, Q1 end wrap-up looks like in terms of a true median price. The list price to close price ratio, not surprisingly, was also up 4%. That was 104% sold price to initial list price. And again, not surprising because we were competing with the holiday week. The median days on market did fall from 10 days to 9 days. So not a real significant shift. Interesting that we've got more inventory coming onto the market. I wish it was higher than the, the absorption rate. 
279 new listings with 272 in escrow doesn't delight me. It doesn't indicate any softening of prices. I'd really like to see three, four, and 500 listings come on the market per week, and hopefully we'll have that going forward. But for now, that's the weekly wrap-up. So as, as we did in 2021, I'm asking notable names to join me and talk about what's going on behind the scenes in SoCal real estate, because I want you to understand what's happening in the market like we do. And as everyone is beginning to figure out, I look at the market a little bit differently, and so do my guests. That's why we get along so well. That's why we serve our clients so well. And what we want to do is I want to bring information to you, because I know what the industry knows. Dennis knows what the industry knows. Absolutely. And we know what the industry really usually doesn't want you to know, but we do. Because your house is likely to be your most valuable asset. It's the linchpin for your family legacy. And if you know what you're doing, it's going to establish your future wealth. So that brings us right back to Dennis Hensling. Thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Happy New Year to everyone. And uh, Wendy, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just jump right in. I mean, you and I have already had this conversation with our shared clients about a rate lock extension and it was going to cost them a fortune. So what are rates doing? You know, uh, it literally since uh, we got back from the uh, New Year's holiday, rates have gone up somewhere between a quarter and a half a point in rate. Wow. Yeah, it's it's been significant. Uh, with the Fed coming in and stating that they are going to do three rate increases this year, the market actually got ahead of itself. Okay. And went uh, full tilt. Uh, what we've been seeing is the biggest challenge is the mortgage-backed securities when it comes to the mortgage side. How so? Um, what ends up happening is the mortgage backs determine ultimately what interest rates are. Okay. So the Fed declining to continue purchasing bonds is putting the emphasis onto the secondary market. Mm. And so the secondary market's going, hey, we want a bigger return. Okay. So uh, literally every day since the, the start of the year, we have seen the mortgage-backed securities off anywhere from 25 to 35 bips, which is Which is basis points. Which is basis points, absolutely. And for those who don't know, can you explain what a basis point is? Yes, uh, basically it's uh, 1% of a hundredth of a point. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is the norm is for every 25 bips that the mortgage backs go off, it increases the fee by approximately an eighth. And for every eighth that we have in fee, uh, it ends up transmitting out into another eighth in rate. So it's it's getting expensive fast. And there is a very, very different relationship between changes in interest rate and changes in cost for interest rate. And that's something that I struggle to explain to my clients. Right. You know, if they had an interest rate of 3.5% at zero points, that 3.5% might cost them what? It could be a point now. Yeah. So that would be equivalent to 1% of the loan amount. And if it's a million dollar loan, that's it's, 10 grand. It's 10 grand. It's, it's a big number. It's real money. Right. Are you expecting that this is going to start to influence people who are in escrow being able to perform? Not necessarily. Th that's the big caveat right now. Uh, income is not an issue for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly, with the pandemic and everything, we have found our, our clients to actually have had a pretty good uh, economic run. Yeah, they couldn't go out to bars and restaurants and blow all their money, right? Right. They, they actually have savings. And uh, what's happened, and we're going back to the, the 2008, 2007, you know, uh, blow up, for lack of a better term. We can't avoid talking about it. Yeah. And what's happened is a, a multitude of the products that were available during that time mm -hmm. have resurfaced. Really? Yep. Are you talking about things like various... Um, adjustable rate loans and negative amortization products? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there is a negative amortization product that just came out. Really? And uh, under the non-QM and qualified mortgage uh, guidelines, you're not supposed to be able to have negative amortization. Right. But the non-QM, which is a non-qualified mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of writing their own ticket right now. So they're becoming the new Wild West of lending. They really are. So can you uh, please help explain to those listeners who don't know what negative amortization is. What is that? You know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Let, let's say that you get a start rate of 2% mm -hmm. and you think that's just wonderful and you're making your payment and you think you're, you know, paying your house down. Right. Well, your actual interest rate is probably closer to 4%. So the difference of interest between the 2% and 4% is tacked onto your principal balance every month 
and continues to grow. So your commitment is to pay 4%, and you're either paying it now or you're paying it later. Correct. The, okay. the idea originally for negative amortization loans was for self-employed borrowers mm -hmm. that have a history of receiving bonus or you know big events every year. Mm -hmm. And it was a great tool to help someone get in and manage their monthly payment. I remember that, and sometimes quarterly, because of course I've been self-employed forever. You know, and there are times that my income monthly is much lower and other times it's much higher. And it was my understanding that type of loan was perfect for us, but you had to be disciplined and actually catch up on the negative that you had created on those down months. You have to catch up or you really get behind quickly. Correct. And, and the biggest challenge was there was so much abuse uh, by the banks in how they put those loans out. No. <laughs> no one gamed the system back then. No. It, and it's, it's interesting because... You look at the institutions and they blame the lenders or the, the brokers mm -hmm. or the, the loan officers. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't write the guidelines. The right. guidelines are what the bank puts out. You give us the rules, we follow them. That's correct. And and sometimes we push the envelope, but we, we are inside the guidelines just barely. Yeah. Okay, so we know that the feds have, have forecast two or three interest rate hikes this year. Do you anticipate any change from that, or do you think that's what we should be expecting? You know, it, it really depends how the uh, the recent COVID variant comes about, mm -hmm. uh, because the the two factors that drive all uh, the economy right now is housing and jobs. Right. And supposedly we are having these phenomenal job numbers, mm -hmm. but if you look at the participation rate, the participation rate really shows that we have a lot less jobs. We do, and, and I have always argued that we still have a significant amount of underemployment. People are technically employed, but they're underemployed. Correct. You know, and so it skews the data into a, a healthier looking scenario. Right. But it, what I'm seeing is that people are either getting significantly wealthy or wealthier or poorer. It, there's definitely creating a bigger divide in the classes. Yeah. And and that's that's what's kind of interesting to the whole scenario because in Orange County, if you look at it, a starter home's a million dollars now. Right. Yeah, I mean that's the price of entry. A tracked home in Mission Viejo built in the seventies easily goes for a million dollars now. Yeah, and then there's multiple offers, and it gets bid up to 1.1, 1 .1 and mm -hmm. then everybody's going to their parents or grandparents saying, hey, we need additional monies to close the escrow mm -hmm. or to even get a, an offer accepted. The sad reality today is that I had to train my agents. on. We've had very extensive classes on appraisal and universal appraisal standards, and we, you know, I whip out the old appraisal forms, and I run through it with them, and we talk about it, and I said, okay, so this is what the bank is likely to say the value for property is. That is completely different in terms of what other buyers are willing to pay in an overbid situation, which is every day. Right. And we have to figure out how to train our buyers about both numbers because they're not the same number. No, they're, they're not. What somebody is willing to pay for a property mm -hmm. versus what a bank is willing to lend on mm -hmm. are two entirely different things. Uh, you can't have the newest sale or your sale mm -hmm. be the highest comp. Right. So it, it definitely creates issues. and. One of the, the big uh, challenges that we've had on the lending side is the appraisers are pretty much controlling the market right now. Of course. And uh, the lead times have gotten ridiculous. Uh, in Northern California, we've seen lead times as much as 60 days to be able to even get an appraisal done. And I thought it was bad down here. Yeah. At uh, Washington, Oregon, we've had some as many as 75 to 90 days. Good heavens. Yeah. For a purchase? For a purchase. What do you see as the trend here? Uh, it's starting to come down because with the interest rates rising, mm -hmm. the amount of refinances are going to fall off. Okay. So we'll see that settle down. The, the biggest challenge has been the, with the appraisers controlling it, they've also increased the prices significantly. Don't you love that? Yeah. When you put control of anything into a finite number of hands, they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And that's sort of what concerns me about real estate. Because as fewer people own and more people are mom and dad landlords, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to right. real estate? That's a, a really good point. And, uh, I had an example. We had a uh, transaction in Texas, mm -hmm. and it was approximately $2.4 million. First appraisal came in at one point eight. Wow. And second appraisal, and they thought, oh, that's ridiculous. And, you know, mm -hmm. second appraisal only came in at $2 million. Interesting. And the challenge was is that the appraisals each cost $5,000. So the client had to invest ten thousand dollars to find out, and they subsequently closed the property by bringing in four hundred thousand dollar difference to bridge the gap. Yeah. yeah, and that's what we're seeing. I I know that again, boots on the ground. As you know, real estate people, we are preparing our clients for this is what it's likely to sell for. This is what it's likely to appraise for. This is the delta. Let's make sure you have enough money to cover that, so we don't have an issue later. 
Right. And on, on the lending side, what we're doing is if somebody is putting 20% down, mm -hmm. we're, we're telling them, hey, just understand, we may end up, you know, with if you, those are the only funds that you have, mm -hmm. we may end up at an 85% or a 90% loan to value. I know. You and I have had yeah, that with our client. Absolutely. But it was a way to bridge the gap without mm -hmm. them having to come up with additional funds. Exactly. So at least they know this may not be my preferred loan, but it's there. I can get the house that I want. I can move in. We can regroup later. Correct. It's it's all about creating solutions, and that's one thing that we've been very good at is coming up with ways to help unique situations. You know, and I know that about you like, through the years, so I can tell that there's something on your brain. Is there an example that you can give us of a, a creative thing recently? Yeah, there, there, there's a bunch of them, quite honestly. It's, Bring uh, it. Yeah, it's one of the things that we've seen is, especially with the self-employed, uh, during COVID, they've done great. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have tax returns to support it yet, though. Oh, right. And fortunately, most of our investors will use one-year tax return. Okay. But until you know, we get into the IRS season, and the IRS just came out yesterday and said, we normally have a million pieces of unopened mail. Mm -hmm. We have six million pieces right <gasps> now. So the chance of even getting your return filed and looked at and approved uh, is probably several months away. Wow. So we All those government employees furloughed because of the pandemic. Correct. Yep. Fascinating. Yeah, no, it's it's created quite the backlog. So how do you overcome that? The the good part is that we have been able to come up with different loan programs. One in particular is for the self employed is a bank statement program. And it's very interesting how it works. Yeah, uh, tell us about depending that. on the industry that you're in, there are predetermined expense factors. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you're a realtor. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, it, which is a great example for you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. uh, so what ends up happening is we take 12 months business bank statements. We look at all the deposits, mm -hmm. exclude the transfers and anything that, you know, is a, a duplicate. Mm -hmm. Then apply that pre-prescribed expense factor to it. So let's say, you know, it's a realtor and they show they show $20,000 a month going into their business account. Right. So they've got $240,000. Well, most realtors have minimal expenses compared to, say, a manufacturer. Right. So they don't have employees and rent and all that because most work out of their home or out of their broker's office. Correct. So typically, we'll use only a 10 or 20% expense factor. Wow. So 80% of that income is considered income now. Right. So all of a sudden, that $20,000 a month becomes $16,000 a month. And that is the income we use for qualifying. Marvelous. Yeah. Well, that'll get you a million-dollar loan. It will definitely get you a million-dollar loan. Fantastic. So given all of this, that we've had to get, like, really creative, you know, and dodge the, the federal furlough bullet, if you will, and get things through underwriting, and the interest rates are increasing, and hopefully the inventory is starting to rise and tick up a little bit, um, what do you think is going to be happening with the housing market? What are your projections? Right now, uh, we do not see prices going down. Mm -hmm. We see prices continuing to escalate. Uh, and right now, the average person that used to be held their home or lived in their home for seven years. Mm -hmm. That's up to 11 years now. Right. So you, you know this. I know this. Thank goodness we're telling everyone else this. Right. Uh, that absolutely. means fewer homes are going to continue to come on the market because right. they're just not recycling like they used to. You know, and, and it's interesting because the, the key now is the millennials are really – all of a sudden embracing homeownership. Absolutely. Which they hadn't. So uh, as they put it, they're coming out of their parents' basements. Yes. Yeah, and that was what I wrote in my last market report. It's like they are sick of living at home. Right. They want out. So uh, given the millennials, and one can only assume that they're a little price sensitive, this is commonly their first go around, how do you think this change in interest rates is going to affect their buying decisions, or do you? You know, it – it's interesting. What we have found is the student loans have been a big issue, mm -hmm. and, or it was, and with the forgiveness, and uh, uh, they've come up with ways to allow them to do it on income-based repayment plans. Oh, and, interesting. And, and a perfect example, I have a, a physician and who has $300,000 worth of student loans. Of course. And the norm would be they would probably have a payment of six or $7,000 a month. Mm -hmm. to repay it. Mm -hmm. But based on their income, the payment's only $2,000 a month. Marvelous. So There's actually common sense approaches going on. There are. I've heard a lot about reform in student loan debt, and a lot of people are calling out for, for forgiveness. Right. What do you think the likelihood is of that? 
I, I think that's what uh, President Biden has really you know, made his case on, is mm-hmm. that you know, we need to restructure things to allow people to have more money to be able to buy things that are of consequence. Of course, like a house right. and a car to get to work. Correct. And, 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 and medical care. I mean, it's shameful, I think, that our country is a first world country and we still have more medical related bankruptcies than anywhere else. It's like we shouldn't we shouldn't be going literally into the poorhouse because we get sick. Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And uh, so in, in to answer your question specifically, I think home prices are going to stay elevated. Mm-hmm. We hopefully the home builders will be bringing more inventory on mm-hmm. uh, once we get over the pandemic shortages of uh, supplies and such and labor and labor right. and uh, i was in san francisco over the weekend and uh, yesterday coming back we drove through the bay and there was 45 container ships sitting there mm. waiting to be uh, downloaded so it's uh, yeah. it's definitely a problem so supply chain's a big issue it really is it really is and my my wonder is, is how much more m- housing can be built here um, until we get some other government mandated reforms, because the NIMBYs are still out there alive and well. Mm-hmm. You know, I was in Huntington Beach and hopped into a grocery store, and this man wanted me to sign a petition to prevent um, overbuilding and to prevent the density and what he was right. saying was the demise of Huntington Beach. And I mm-hmm. said, "Would you rather have the homeless people camping out on your front lawn? Because these are your choices." Right. No, yeah. and you know, with the uh, ruling in California for the ADUs, mm-hmm. and uh, unfortunately, they put a lot of restrictions on it. So they did. it's you know, once you get to four uh, above four hundred ninety nine square feet, it's a whole different set of issues, mm-hmm. reassessments, uh, different permit fees, and all that. Well, five hundred square feet is a pretty small unit to live in. It is, and it's not terribly cost efficient to build something that small. No. So I, I've had neighbors talk to me about how they're getting estimates of $100,000 to build an ADU. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that at all. Yeah, and that can be really cost prohibitive for, you know, John and Jane Doe. Right. So uh, the solution is, is obviously the economy of scale. I just don't know that we can do that here. Right. That, that's, that's going to be the challenge. And mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the biggest thing and when we were discussing the economy, the other big factor and what the Fed is trying to get their arms around is inflation Mm -hmm. and you know everybody who's been to the gas pump been to the grocery store or tried to buy anything Mm -hmm. we are paying more for everything we are and it's interesting a very good friend of mine is an economist and i've got to get him on the show and uh, he gets very um enthusiastic in the conversation about inflation and he said we have both parties kicked that can down the road for 40 years we have to face the music we have to it's it's coming. We can't act like this is you know one party or another who's done it. D- does that make sense to you? You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I think it, Japan would be the 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 one object to look at. Uh, they kicked the can for a long time, mm-hmm. and they've had deflation, hyperinflation. They've had every you know variation and flavor of it. Right. And their GDP is awful, yeah. and uh, they still have inflation. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's something that we need to get our arms around. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way the Fed has gone about it, though, I think is all of a sudden announcing three price hikes or, you know, rate mm-hmm. increases. Uh, it really set the market off the wrong way because mm-hmm. if you notice, the stock market tech has gotten mm-hmm. just pummeled for since the first year. Sure. Uh, you've had a few oil stocks and a few others be able to keep up. But otherwise, the market in general is, is going to get hit. Yeah. It, it makes me think of that old um, adage they used to say, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. Yep. And I feel like when the Fed sneezes, you know, the whole economy catches a cold. Yeah. And, 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 and more to that point, when, when the Fed sneezes about real estate, it, we ha- we're still so much the epicenter of the economy, and we tend to shake things up when there are announcements. But, and, and going back to that, okay, so the Fed has announced these rate increases. Where would you say – Generally, interest rates were January 1, and where do you expect them to be in December, barring any other strange calamity? Good question. Uh, when we ended uh, you know, 2021 conforming loan, which uh, is now up to over $650,000, mm-hmm. was holding around 2 and 7 eighths percent. That's incredible. Yeah, great, great loan. Well, the loan today is 3 and 3 eighths. And that's still an incredible rate. Which we're still historically low. 
But that's going to go up into the fours by the end of the year? I think the four is going to be kind of the, the top end. Okay. Uh, I think it will, will stabilize. And once we see the secondary market starting to buy the bonds, mm -hmm. which it will, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be a, a big you know, a stabilizing factor to the whole deal. One of the things that's happened, and it was just announced, uh, is Fannie and Freddie are going to put premiums on second home loans and on non-owner occupied loans. And I thought they already were. Well, there is. But what ended up happening about three years ago, in a day, the, they said, we're going to increase the delivery fees, what it costs us to deliver a loan to Fannie or Freddie. Okay. Anywhere from seven-eighths of a point to 3.875 points. Wow. So a $100,000 loan, all of a sudden our cost went up to almost $4,000. That's additional. incredible. So what's happened is uh, they've made the announcement that that's going to occur in April. So now everybody is positioning themselves and making sure they can deliver prior to All April. All right. So th that's a big news flash, people. If you want to buy a second home, you need to do it before April. Yep. Absolutely. Now, 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 now. Yeah. And that just came out, uh, I believe, Wednesday of last week. So it's 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 hot off the press. That's really going to impact a lot of areas like Miami, um, e even part of the Gulf Coast, and certainly us. Right. Interesting. Well, you know, and, and it's funny because uh, Zillow had just put out its study of what was the most number of uh, contacts for types of property, mm -hmm. and it was Lake Tahoe for second homes. Wow. In the country, and it was wow. like five to one. So. It'll be interesting. And it's so gorgeous up there. I mean, if you've been, oh. I totally understand that. I do. All right. So before we wrap this up, you had mentioned that you do see price acceleration through the future. And I've been project projecting that we're going to see price appreciation through this year, possibly into 2023. And all the big, you know, all the big boxes and, and talking heads are saying there we should expect between 6 and 8% appreciation. But because, because Orange County has been its own little hotbed of nonsense, I'm thinking that's going to be more like 10 to 12 percent. What do you think? Um, 10 is the number that I've been you know, looking at, and okay. I tend to agree that that's what's going to be. And perfect example, I have a client who's made an offer on a property. It's 1.1 million, mm -hmm. and uh, to get it accepted, they had to pay one two. Yep. There's your yep. 10 percent right, right there. Right there. There we are. All right. Well, I'm going to um, shift gears here, and we're going to okay. start getting to some more personal questions. So for those of you that went to sleep because we were nerding out, hang in there. It's going to be way more fun because Dennis is a super fun guy. But first, Paul, would you please tell us about our sponsor this week? Absolutely. First, I've got to put my pen down and my paper and all the notes I'm taking here to remind everybody that you have surrounded yourself with some great partners like your guest today and our sponsor, Ford and Diulio. Ford and Diulio is an Orange County-based boutique litigation firm with experienced attorneys from big law firms. The partners who founded Ford and Diulio, they did so on the concept of aligned interest, where their success is directly tied to your success, where they're rewarded for being efficient and effective and not dragging it out forever, and where they engage in the relentless pursuit of their clients' goals, whether in litigation, mediation, or even trial if it comes to that. If that's the kind of attorney you want representing you, then you owe it to yourself to check them out. FordDiulio.com, F-O-R-D-D-I-U. L I O for Diulio.com. All right. Yeah, you dropped a bombshell there. I got I got to <laughs> announce it here again. You just casually said, Oh, there's going to be a big change in people buying second homes. I have a second home out in the desert that uh, I inherited out there. There's lots of people out in that area in Southern California or out in, I don't know, people who been buying homes here at the beaches from other places Absolutely. in the country here. Mm -hmm. This is their escape. I know somebody just bought a big, huge house. They're from Texas, and they come to the beach here periodically. You're telling me that's going to change. So there's going to be an well, impact on that. The cost to finance is going to change. Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll start seeing a ripple effect uh, almost immediately. That's wow. interesting. All wow. right. Okay. Well, we know what we're going to be blogging about this week, right? <laughs> yeah. Hustle, hustle, yeah. hustle. So what other questions, Paul? I expect more. Well, I, you know, I guess I'm just wondering what it does to the market when interest rates hit even 3% or 4%. What does that do to a million-dollar starter home's average cost? Does it? Uh, it what's the – every point that goes up or, every, uh, or how much does that add to – 
per 100,000. Is there some formula or something? I yeah, can there is. Uh, you're probably looking, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, one, I have a client last night. We had a discussion, 1.2 million as well, uh, putting 20% down, 960 loan amount. Uh, they went from three and seven eighths to four percent because there's a, they're a bank statement program, and it translated to about a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Wow. So yeah, it's, okay. it's not prohibitive, but it's real money. Yep. Yeah. And when you add all the other real money, the hundred dollars here, the hundred dollars there, the fifty dollars mm -hmm. this, it just seems like at some point, isn't this going to just cool off sales? And I guess what I'm wondering, we're all wondering, does it stall out and stay there for a while, or does it come back down? Well, t uh, as Dennis had said, I mean, we're seeing the automatic 10% appreciation because of competition. I'm hoping that the increase in interest rates will actually just sort of quell that silly growth. So a million-dollar home will, will sell for closer to a million dollars rather than a million one. And it'll million just kind of stall it for a while. It, it'll just of. stall the growth, exactly. It's not going to kill it. It's not going to reverse it. No, uh, it, it's still a supply issue. Uh, we, you know, if you look at it, uh, at the end of December, there was about 1,800 listings for all of Orange County. Mm -hmm. A normal market is 6,000 to 8,000 listings. Wow. I love that you're a nerd like me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I've been saying. Yeah. I've got a client that came to me. Um, her mother has to go into a care facility, and so she needs to sell her mom's home for maximum, you know, dollars to help pay for her care. Super classic situation. And I looked at it, and I said, here is where I think the property itself, based upon its characteristics, would likely sell. However, and this happens to be in Elisa Viejo, I pulled up. I said, there are 20 active listings in Elisa Viejo. Total. Any price range, any type of property, 20. That's it. So if you've got a smaller, more affordable condo in a context of there's just nothing to buy, and somebody needs a small condo for mom, dad, son, whatever, they're going to buy it, and they're going to pay a premium to get it. Cause Absolutely right. And, you know, think about it. In Orange County, there's over 3 million people, mm -hmm. and there's, you know, 16, 1,800 homes available. Right. Uh, infinitesimal numbers. So it's, you know, it, there's just not sufficient supply. And they're still coming in from out of the area, Dennis. It's making me crazy. I've got a couple of clients right now from Silicon Valley. I'm like, all right, here we go. It's nuts. All right, so... Enough with the nerding out. Mm. You had your chance, Paul. You're done. So I'm going to move into, into the personal thing. And, and before I get to my favorite sort of spin on the Vanity Fair Proust questionnaire, I just want to lob one over to Dennis and say, so as of this morning, how many cars do you own? Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I say this because Dennis and his twin brother, Al, um, they like cars. Can you yep. share that passion? I mean, your, your history behind the wheel is really remarkable. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, uh, it was interesting. Was my brother was a motorcycle racer and then a go-karter mm -hmm. and then uh, got into cars. And I started uh, in go-karts and drag racing and all that and then ended up in uh, formula cars. I, like, seriously, people really driving formula cars. Yes. It's yep, awesome. absolutely. And just had a lot of fun with it and, and was pretty successful at it. So it was, it was a, a nice uh, venture to do and uh, still dabble in it. And we've, we've accumulated a, a fair collection of cars now. So it's been, been a lot of fun. It is so much fun when you invite us over to your man cave so we can see all the new toys. Well, anytime you're welcome. It's a glorious, glorious place. And if anybody wants to have an event, especially a non nonprofit fundraiser event, reach out to me. We'll talk about maybe doing it at Dennis's Man Cave. Absolutely. We have one coming up uh, for CASA, uh, I believe, in May 13th, and a couple others already scheduled out. So Marvelous. Yeah, we, we'd love to be able to let uh, the nonprofits utilize it and do what we can. All right, he's teasing it. Now, how many cars you got? Give me a number. Has he got 100? You got five? You got no. 50? Uh, no, they, they switch them out. It's not that big. Yeah, a it, it primarily Porsches and uh, Ford GTs and you know, a, a few. There's there's about a dozen over there now. Mm -hmm. wow. Still have a couple of the racing motorcycles there, too. Yeah, there's uh, about 15 motorcycles as well. So It's a pretty fun place, Paul. Play your cards right. I'll invite you over. Well, I'm a car geek. You can look <laughs> around the studio here at all the little car paraphernalia we got in here. So, yeah. All Absolutely. Right. All right. I, th I think that's just delightfully fun. That and Dennis is an experienced and apparently very, very competent bicycle a bicyclist, and, and you do races and, and tours, don't you? We do. We do a lot of uh, Grand Fondos uh, throughout the country, and uh, we try to get five or six in a year, and uh, we've got a really nice group of, of gentlemen that we ride with, and uh, we get out at least two to three times a week, so That's it's been so great. fantastic. See, so yeah. not just a brainiac and a geek like me. The man's a stud. It's crazy. All right, all right, so 
enough of, of Dennis and going down that rabbit hole. I'm going to go back to what I normally do and ask you my favorite questions a la Proust questionnaire. So starting with, we know that you're from Orange County. What city do you call home? San Clemente. We've been uh, in San Clemente now for 42 years. Wow. Now, San Clemente has a lot of a lot. Some hills, some gorgeous ocean views. It's close enough to the beach that you get, you know, the, the, the nice ocean breezes. What's it like to bicycle from there? Uh, brutal. I'll bet. <laughs> I live at the highest point in San Clemente, so uh, if I go down the hill, i got to come back up the hill. Oh, better you than me. All right, so given that there's a lot going on and it's tough to get back home after a ride, what do you love most about being there? You know, um, it was interesting. Both my wife and myself, uh, our parents were in businesses where we moved a lot. Mm -hmm. I went to 18 different schools over the course of my educational process. I did not know this. And my wife, uh, pretty close to an equal number. Mm -hmm. And when we decided to have children, we said we're going to stay in one community and let them go to kindergarten, grade school, and high school with the same group. That's wonderful. So we, we were able to do that, fortunately. And uh, St. Clemente is a little village by the sea. It's got a lot to offer, and it's still the hometown feel, and, and it's been great for us. It really is great. It really is. And obviously, you love it, too. It's been there for 40-plus years. Yep. I mean, that, that speaks highly. So given all of that, you've had all of this time to travel and, and still nest in place with your wife, what would you say is your most treasured possession? Uh, my family. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, I've got uh, two daughters and my wife for 42 years, so it's been uh, And it's aren't been you a grandparent now? I have four grandchildren, which uh, they, uh, they are the reward for having had children. <laughs> <laughs> is it reward or retribution? Uh, reward. <laughs> they, uh, because the, the great part is you get to take them, spoil them, and send them home and not worry about it. That's fantastic. Yeah. But given all that you've done with the company and obviously with all the charitable work that you do and your children, and your e exotic race car driving career, what do you see as your most important achievement to date? Uh, I'd say my marriage. I would agree with you. Well, and you. I've met your wife. She's spectacular. Well, thank you. I mean, she's beautiful. She's smart. She's supportive. I've been to events, and I cannot believe the woman is such a brilliant chef. Yeah. Just, yeah. She's, she's, she's special, so yeah. it's great. You thank you. You won the lottery. I love <laughs> that. All right, so do you have a personal motto? I don't know. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, we fashioned one for the company, which is trusted, tried, and true. And that's kind of what we try to live by. Uh, mm -hmm. We're very much solution-based, uh, and we get uh, all our businesses referral. We don't advertise at all. You know, uh, I have to. Yeah, so it's it's been great, and it's it's a testament to how we've done business for 32 years. I can speak to that. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I forbid you to retire. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere for a while. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm super, super pleased to bring Dennis, and hopefully you will indulge me and come back repeatedly through the year so we can update things. I would be happy to. Marvelous. Let's put you on a quarterly schedule then. So I want you to join us next week for our next exciting interview. But for now, let's call it a wrap. And please do follow Veracity Real Estate Co. on Instagram. And soon you'll be able to find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Have a great week.